So you need to get your paints ready to try out some mixes for the C. And you, it's, you may not have all the colors I've got. That's okay. I don't expect you to have all the colors that I have, and you don't have to go out and buy the colors I have. I've acquired them slowly over a period of many, many years. And um, really, I don't, use, I don't use the beautiful colors I buy very often. I just use the colors I'm used to, but they are kind of nice to have. Now, for Christmas a couple of years ago, my daughter-in-law bought me a beautiful set, set of um, the Ganzai Tambi paints. I have the whole box. So it's a, it's a really big green box full of beautiful paints. And I really like to use these for my calligraphy paintings. They, they don't spread as much as the regular watercolors. I don't know about how light fast they are, but they, they are kind of nice for doing illustration and different things. And the nice thing is you can take the little paints out. They're all in little tubs and you don't have to have the whole box on your tabletop. And they've also been designed, I'll get my brush. They've been designed, they're Japanese, so they've been designed so that you can get a Chinese or Japanese calligraphy brush into the paint this way. So they've been specially designed for that. So it's just, it was an indulgence. We had a, you know, secret Santa list and I put my uh, Ganzai Tambi uh, paints on there and I, I really like them. Not, not necessarily for ordinary watercolor, but for other things. But there's a lovely color in here called Malachite this one and there's also this turquoise green which looks almost black but it's a rather lovely turquoise color so I'm just going to show you what they look like uh, one of the ones I have from Core, which is golden paints is cobalt teal and that is really quite a lovely one for sunny ocean so I'm going to put it what I'm going to do and what I think I'd like you to do if you've got a practice book is put your color on nice and strong so I've just gone into my my paint and I've got the color as strong as I can get it on my paintbrush there and make a little square. Now I'm going to dilute that color down and see, see what it looks like when I don't use it full strength, when I use it diluted, what kind of an effect can I get? And maybe I want a little bit more paint in there because when we do the ocean, we don't want the color full strength because we won't be able to see the light glowing through the, the water. So it's going to look too dense and dull if you have your paint full strength. The way to get that sort of reflective light quality on water is to start off with it really, really diluted so that you, you can put maybe layers of waves over the top, but you still have that lovely light growing glowing through the paint from the white paper so this is really to get you used to not painting your ocean with thick or strong paint even though you want to see strong color in watercolor we have to be thinking about how things reflect light now this is the malachite from the kurtaki paints they're very creamy and it's a little bit more greeny so maybe a little bit too green for an ocean color, but very pretty nonetheless. I'm going to dilute it out a little bit in my palette and put some dilutions on. I have a problem because I don't have a color printer and so I can't see the picture. Oh, oh dear. Well, um, do you have... Do you have, oh, I guess, do you have an iPhone or something? You can look at it while, you know, oh, or an I yeah. iPad. Sometimes I have that open. Okay, um, I'll have a look at that. Right. I'm going to just, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just go to my image, see if I can share this image. Here it is. Um, so this is the image that I bought. Can you see, can you see that? Is it showing that on the screen? And we're looking to sort of make that, that beautiful, beautiful teal ocean color that looks like it's, it's light and reflecting the light and still making that beautiful color. And we have, it's quite difficult to do that 
um, with watercolor, we have to really sort of manipulate what we're doing a little bit. So the um, so this is the malachite from Kurataki, and the second one is the turquoise green, which is a very pretty color. So these are just out of the pan colors. This is maybe a little dark for a Caribbean ocean, but if it was mixed with um, mixed with something else, like a little bit of yellow, maybe it could tone down. I'm just it's always good. I before I paint a painting, and this is sort of something that we're going over today. Before I paint a painting, I do this every time. I mix a bunch of colors. I make notes about them. I figure out which one's going to work best. And I also try and figure out how much water I need to mix with that paint to make it work. So we're going from, this is pretty much full strength and then about half strength. And then we're, we're adding more and more water to dilute those paints down. Now, I don't know what colors you have. And if you don't have phthalo green, you can use viridian green. It's a, uh, some of the, some of the makes of paint use exactly the same chemicals to make the phthalo or make the viridian. Sometimes they just add a bit of white to the phthalo green to make a viridian green. That's what it says on the tube. So I know they do because they list their paint colors. So um, the phthalo green is much more transparent because they make the viridian green quite often by mixing the phthalo green pigment with a little bit of white. So that will make it more opaque. Not too much, it's still quite a um, transparent color. So I have mixed cerulean, which is a lovely cool blue with some phthalo green. And I think that was my favorite mix for ocean color. So I, I bring my mixing tray over. So I've got my cerulean, I, this is by M. Graham and my phthalo green is by M. Graham. And I'm gonna mix those two together until I get what I think is close to a Caribbean ocean color. And I'm gonna put them on full strength. The thing with Viridian green and phthalo green is they are very, very strong on their own, but beautiful to mix with other colors. See, this is the, this is the phthalo green by itself, really strong color, but you can sure uh, make it more beautiful by adding other colors. So this is the cerulean blue and this is half and half water and half full strength. I'm gonna add a little bit more water and a little bit more water. And we, we can make the ocean much more uh, sparkly and light by not having as strong a paint. The next one is phthalo blue with phthalo green. And you're going to get a very strong ocean color with these. So uh, this is my phthalo blue, which is a Winsor & Newton one. And my phthalo green, both of them are very cool. And when I mean cool, I don't mean, you know, in the sense of he was a real cool cat. I mean, they are considered cool, a cool blue and a cool green. I could, I could make them stronger for the full strength, just going for a little bit more pigment. So full strength, really dark. Now, when you use these two colors together, very dark, but beautifully transparent. One of those gorgeous transparent darks. So now we do half and half. Follow along if you can. I'm gonna add a bit more water and a bit more water. So we get a different, different effect. And this, this would be, this one, first one would be way too wet dark for the ocean. You're wanting to go more to the third one to make a good ocean color. This one is phthalo green with azo yellow. So you have to be careful not to add too much yellow. I always forget that I should add the yellow first because I don't want to contaminate it with my green and I always forget that. So I'm reminding myself and put my azo yellow down and then my phthalo green. 
And I think that's going to be maybe too, too greeny. Yeah, I'm finding that just too green. You might find Viridian works better. But if you wanted, where this is nice is where those parts are under the wave or in the part of the wave where the sun glows through or part of the ocean where the sun really reflects off it. Sometimes they are a very, very greeny color and you could use this lovely diluted one for that. And the last one is thalo green with ultramarine. And this is one that you can use for the darker areas like the horizon on the ocean. Yeah, I, both of mine are M. Graham, the ultramarine and the thalo green. I'm going to put those down here. See, it's pretty dark when you put your thick layer on, but I will dilute it. And dilute it and dilute it down so we can get some beautiful colors that way. Now this cerulean blue and phthalo green is my favorite one for doing the ocean color after trying these out, but I do love the cobalt teal. And I think if I mix the malachite with one of these colors, I'm gonna mix it with that one I just made with the, the ultramarine blue and the phthalo green. I'm just going to use that down here. And that's rather beautiful too. Now I can see that the malachite has white in it. Any times a paint is opaque and um, sort of more pastel like that, you know that there's white paint added. You just have to remember that, that if there's white paint added, it's gonna be more opaque and you're probably gonna have to use more water to, to get your paper to glow through. The cobalt teal from Core is really, really granulated when it's on thick, which is kind of cool. Um, maybe not good for an ocean. It's kind of nicer to have the ocean smooth. So cerulean blue and phthalo green that look like a really good mix. We're gonna practice a couple of skies before we get started. And even if you know how to do these skies, it's really good to just get warmed up this way by practicing them first. It gives you a good feel for your paints and what we're gonna be doing. So let's talk about making a, a summer sky, a lovely day sky with some fluffy white clouds and just really simple. This is where we don't want the focus to be too much on the sky. We just want the sky to be a lovely summer sky in the background. So first of all, I'm gonna get my number 10 brush and I'm gonna wet the background. Now you can use any soft brush you like for wetting the background. This is just the one I have to hand and it's just a good size for a small, small painting. I like this brand of brush because it holds a lot of water. So it, uh, it's good for getting the water on there fairly quickly and evenly. So I'm just lifting the page to check. Pretty sure that's all good. Now, if you're going to do fluffy clouds, you're gonna leave the white paper as your cloud. And the best color for a lovely summer sky is cerulean blue. And we're gonna try just, just cerulean blue. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna mix the paint with my number 10 brush, but I think I'm gonna to switch to my number eight brush to, to do the sky. Now, you're gonna to have to think backwards. You're gonna to have to think I'm going to leave white paper where I want white clouds. And you really shouldn't draw them in first because otherwise you're gonna have pencil lines everywhere. What you want is for your paint to guide you and do its own thing. So I always like to have my corners at least colored in because otherwise you don't have what I call a stopper at the edge of the paper, a stopper to stop the eye going out of your picture. And if I put my, cerulean blue in the corner there, it's going to flood into that wet paper and form clouds all by itself. Now I want to put a lot of blue just along those edges here so that I've got that stopper on that edge, but I don't want to come down too far. And if I, even if I want to get the paint to come further, I can tip it like this and the paint will come down further and make even fluffier looking clouds. 
Sometimes it's good to have your paper tipped up a little bit, but I don't want to because of the shine on the camera. Now we're gonna to have to have a bottom to some of these clouds. So very gently, I'm going to put in a little bit of blue where I think the bottom of the clouds might be. Now don't make this blue too wet. If your paper's wet and you come in with very wet blue, you're going to get a lot of runny stuff happening which, and the blue will kind of just fade off to nothing. You need a little bit of strength to the blue because it's going to dry much lighter. And as you come down the sky to the, towards the horizon, clouds get thinner and thinner. They, they get big and fluffy up here near the zenith of the sky and they get thinner down here. So you can, papers dry down here. You can make these little clouds down here much thinner. Don't do too much. Tip it a little bit, let the paint and the paper do the work for you in the water. And don't go back in and put water afterwards because you'll get, unless you know how to control that water, you're going to get big back runs and what are called cauliflowers where the water swooshes out into the paint. It will not look attractive. If you just have faith and just let it do its thing, you will, get, you will get a lovely summer sky happening. What you have to remember is this is your background. Your sky is going to be behind your mountains and your trees and all kinds of other things. So it's not going to be the focal point for your viewer. You don't have to fuss. I'm, I'm not going to fuss. Right here, I've got two little dry patches where I didn't get the water on the paper properly. Not going to bother me at all because maybe I'm going to put the ocean down there. Maybe I'm going to have some mountains. I, I'm not even worried. I don't think anyone would even notice. And I certainly don't want to go back in and, and um, put water. Now, one method you will see people recommend or do, you'll see it on Facebook, on, I mean, YouTube and different places. They'll get a Kleenex. Sometimes they'll get it in a big ball. I don't want to mess this guy up. This one turned out quite nicely. So I want to show you um, on a separate piece of paper what they do. So I, I'm going to do with them what? not to do things and do that on a separate piece here I'm just i'm gonna hand draw my border and i'll wet my paper remember this is what not to do i think it's important to know that because if you recognize it's something that you do do and um you've maybe been struggling a bit then you can understand why things are not working. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I've wet the paper and I'm gonna put, put the sky in. I'm going a bit quicker this time because I just want to get the sky in for you. And it does help if you just wait a minute for the, the water to soak in. And tip it. See, I was a little bit more careful last time, so I got a much better effect. Now, this is what not to do. And zoom in just a bit. Don't take your paper towel or Kleenex and start pushing it on your paper to lift out clouds. I've seen this so many times. And what you got get is something like little sheep skipping around in the sky. They all come out the same shape. They all come out with quite hard edges and they don't, they don't look soft and fused into the background. Now, what you can do is if you have a little bit of cloud that hasn't worked properly, you can twist a corner and I would use a Kleenex. Paper towel often is too thick. It has a pattern in it. Not good for this, but take the corner of your Kleenex, twist it into like a little brush tip. And if you want to, if you've got a little bit too much paint or you need a little bit of soft cloud, you can just like touch it, just touch it to your paper and just suck up a little bit of your paint. Now, cerulean blue does not stain. It floats on the top of the paper for quite a long time. That's why it's good for skies. That's why it will mix with your water and do a good job for you. So it's a great one for lifting. And you can use a thirsty brush or a tissue if you need, if you need to lift out a little bit of sky. Let's go back to this one over here that turned out better because I was more careful. I waited a couple of 
few seconds for the water to to um soak in now this is almost dry but there's the places here where it's not quite dry and of course the cerulean blue because it doesn't stain is still kind of floating on the top of the paper and i could if i wanted take out a few tiny horizontal clouds and maybe just a tiny bit around these ones, but you have to be so careful not to mess up your sky doing this. I mean, look at the difference. Big, hard things galloping through the sky or something that's soft and fused. And you've got all gradations of color in that fusing of the water and the paint happening. And of course, once you get good at this, you can add other colors, you can add some grays, you can put on a, a sort of a golden color first, some gold and pink first, and then the blue. You can do all kinds of things, um, but please don't do this. Thirsty brush, if you don't know what a thirsty brush is, a thirsty brush is one that you put in the water and then you, you dry it till it's almost, you know, it's just damp. And then you can suck up you can suck up paint or water because the brush is thirsty and it will suck the water up. Now, this is a much nicer method look for getting a soft cloud rather than the, the Kleenex. The Kleenex is great for a sudden mess that you just want to like dab up and get off your paper. But the thirsty brush, you clean it often, then dry it on a towel gently. And then you can use that thirsty brush to pull out some paint and form maybe a little bit of softness to the top of some of your clouds. And it's a great little tool. I think thirsty brush is better than most things. There's still a bit of water here. You have to keep washing and drying your brush and cleaning it. Otherwise you just, you just move paint around. But look at the difference from me using a, a soft thirsty brush to a hard push with my Kleenex. So a little, little lesson on, and we are going to do the sky like this, but we're gonna do something a little bit different to get the palm tree in. Because if you try and put your yellow palm tree over this blue, it will just go dark green. You're not going to get that beautiful glow through the yellow palm trees. And I just want to go back to, want to go back to the photo, share the screen here. So we have the image. If you look, if you look up here on the front of the tree, they are very, very yellow where they're catching the sunlight. And that is part of what makes the painting rather beautiful. And under here and the, um, the stems, I don't know what you call them, like the vein, the bit right in the middle of the leaf. It's, I'm sure it's got a name, but I can't think what it is, rib. They are quite often very light, like uh, almost white, yellowy, golden white. We're going to try and use just yellow for them today. Up here, this is almost white where it catches the light. So we have to think about that. And, and I, I thought that it would be a good idea, and I tried it out, to actually add the yellow into the sky, wet in wet, because you're not gonna notice it once you put all the dark fronds on, all you're gonna see is your nice light yellow there. So we're gonna practice that as well. Now you've practiced, hopefully you've practiced your cerulean blue and fluffy skies. Now we're gonna practice putting the, the yellow in. We're gonna try cobalt blue as well, just so you can see the difference when they're dry between the two blues and decide which one you think you like for the sky. Cobalt blue is a, a warm blue, whereas cerulean blue is a cool blue. And sometimes the Caribbean skies are quite warm, but I find ultramarine's warm too, but I find ultramarine sometimes too strong for the sky. So cobalt is a lovely alternative. Now my tube of cobalt says that it's the ultramarine pigment mixed with white. Again, it makes it less transparent, but lighter. So I've mixed up a little bit of uh, cobalt here ready. And I'm also going to need some bright yellow. Now, you know me, I really like my Azo yellow from M. Graham. 
but you may not have that yellow. You may have cadmium yellow or you might have permanent yellow. Whatever bright, nice bright yellow you have, use that one. Uh, not, not lemon particularly because that is um, a little bit too bright, too light. It has white in it again and um, can sometimes be a little bit opaque. So I like the transparent ones better. So number 10 brush, clean water and start. Almost all skies are best if you start with wet paper. The sky is actually a very light part of most paintings, sky and water. The, the water reflects the light from the sky. The sky is pretty light. And if you make the sky the same value as your background, it's all going to look very one, one value, one tone, not, not particularly striking or dramatic. I'm just lifting the paper to make sure it's all wet. Now, here's the thing, where this palm tree is, I want to have yellow for those beautiful light palms. So I'm going to paint along my frond lines. And that's all I put in for my palm tree. I don't put all the bits, the hanging fronds in. Let's put those center spines of the lines. I'm gonna put the yellow on first. And again, don't put the yellow on too, too watery, but not too strong. If this starts to dry and it's still not completely dry, you can always go back in with a little bit more yellow before it's dry. And I'm going to the cobalt blue. I don't think I'm going to like the cobalt blue sky as much as the cerulean, but it doesn't hurt to try when we're practicing. And again, I'm going to start from the top corner. So my corner is, I'm going to put a little bit in here. Now, it doesn't matter if some of the blue and the yellow mix in this. It's not like our sky last week where we had a sunset and we don't want green. It doesn't matter if we get green around the tree because we're going to have green in the tree. So you don't have to worry this time. We're putting on a wet in wet background that it's fine if some of the blue mixes with the yellow. Absolutely fine. But we, we're not deliberately going to try and make it do that. We're just not going to fuss if it does, because it doesn't matter. And then we're taking the sky down and it will eventually meet the ocean horizon line where we will, we will stop with our blue. Let me put a little bit in here. Again, doesn't matter if it mixes with the yellow. If you get all of your paint the same consistency with dilution and not more wet than the background, it's not going to do a whole bunch of mixing. That's the key. My blue was the same dilution as my yellow, and that was a little bit less wet than my paper. So I can put them side by side and I get very little overlap. And that makes it easy to put wet and wet on your paper and not worry about it. And I can even bring this in here a little bit and think maybe I can have that in there a little bit for, for some shadows in the tree. You have to decide, is, is everything running together? If everything's running together, your paint's too wet, you need to use a little less water. If your paint's not mixing with your water, then it's too dry, you need to add a little bit more water. This is what this is all about, it's practicing how much water to add. Now I'm gonna get a little bit of that yellow, but not, not wet, like almost dry yellow now. I'm just gonna add a little bit more intensity to where the, the spines will be, just a little bit more. You'd be surprised this will fade. And by the time we come back to, to do the dark green and everything, you'll hardly see it. So you have to give it a little bit of a punch, punch up there too. So you can see it after it's all dry. Now, the thing about backgrounds is they fade into the background eventually when the rest of the painting is done. So you can go a little bit free and wet and wet and not worry too much. So I'm going to pause the recording so that I can ask you if you have any questions, let you catch up. So let's just um, look at pause, resume. So we're recording again. And we're ready with, I've got my ash paper here. I'm ready to start what we just practiced. And we're gonna, I'm going to use cerulean blue. 
I like the cerulean blue for the summery skies. And I'm going to put the yellow where the tree fronds are. And you can see I've just kind of done the, the spines of them. I'm going to put all the rest in with a brush. It doesn't matter if you've drawn them in with pencil. That's absolutely fine. I, I just prefer to put them in with a brush. And I'm not going to wet the whole paper. I'm going to wet down to the horizon line for the sky and definitely need to to do that. My, my pencil lines got very smudged this week, but I'm just going to have to hope they disappear under the paint. Now we're going to, now I don't, I don't want to put too much paint on the tree trunks. So though I'm going to put some dark brown on there, I still want to leave some light patches on the tree trunks for sort of that golden look to them. So I will, I'm, I'm going to tip it just to make sure it's all wet, little dry spot there. And just let it soak in. Now this is the 100% cotton paper. So it needs a little bit more time to soak in. That way your paint's not going to float on the top too much. And while it's soaking in, I can mix a bit more azo yellow for the the palm fronds. And put those in. Now, because I didn't mix the yellow very watery, it should not go too far. It should stay kind of where I put it. Another alternative is to just leave that area white, not put any paint on it, which is what I tried last time I did this. And that worked out pretty well too. There's, there's, many, there's many different ways to do things. Like this one, I kind of left it mainly white clouds behind it. And this one too, I left mainly white clouds behind it. But this was kind of a, a different look. This one, the sky was ultramarine blue and I just thought it looked too stormy and dark so I've, I've tried i've tried this many times to try and get the right summary look to the painting i'm just i'm just waiting for that to soak in a little bit and for the water to soak in i got a little piece of fluff on there right now cerulean blue i have to decide what brush i want i think I think that number six brush for a little, this is five by seven, a little painting doesn't need a very big brush. So get my cerulean blue. And just like on the practice one, I want to start at the corner and bring that blue in so that I have at least a stopper at the corner of the paper. And I can kind of come into here on the palm tree, maybe come in here. You come in here. Think about it. You, if your paper's wet enough, you can take a little bit of time with this. I mean, you can't take forever because it's going to dry. But but if you've been careful to wet your paper well, you've got you've got some working time. And because this is a small painting, we don't want too many clouds in there. It's going to be too distracting. Remember, I don't want anything on the tree trunk really. If any blue gets on there, I'm gonna fix that in just a moment. I'm gonna have green greenery behind here. A bit in here. Not too many clouds happening. And bring a little bit more blue in here. Now, there's a little bit of blue got on the tree trunk, and I'm going to use that thirsty brush I told you about. I'm going to wash my brush. I'm going to really dry it off on a, my towel. And I'm just going to suck up that little bit of water and paint 
that's on the tree trunk because I want to use some raw sienna on there to make them sort of golden. And that blue will dry pretty light by the time it dries. So it will be fine. Might want to come up in here with a bit of the blue. Remember, if it makes green, that's great. No big problem. That's maybe a little strong, but I'm going to put a lot of dark greens in there, so I'm not too bothered about it. Now, I don't want to do the ocean at this point because the color from the ocean is going to bleed up into the sky and we'll get a blending of the two colors and no definition at the horizon line. So what I'm going to do at the moment is I'm going to shadow the sand. Now, the first one that I did for you, I painted the sand with a very light raw sienna and yellow mix. And afterwards, I thought, I'm just going to look for my original. I thought I should have just left the sand white. I'm pretty sure the, the sand in the original photo was white. Let's go check. Let's go look at the original photo. So it's it's close to white. If you think that this these lines here are fairly white and the waves are fairly white, it's a very, very light beige. This time, I'm just going to leave it white, I think, and see what that looks like, just for a very dramatic look. But I do want to put in some of these shadows that are where the water has come up on the sand and then receded. I want to do that. And if you notice, this sky is more of a cobalt blue and very few clouds. We've just got a few down here. We've done the sky differently. And that's just for dramatic effect for and for doing things how we want to do them rather than exactly how they are in the photo. So this is all dry here. So I can put on that shadowy color along the, the shore there. And I want to get my picture to look at. So I've got a picture to, to look at here. And I just want to check what colors I've used for cobalt blue, raw sienna, and permanent rose. So I have some cobalt blue here already that I use for the sky. So I'm going to reuse that. And raw sienna is that sandy color. And I don't want to mix all of it. I'm just going to take a little bit of that blue with the raw sienna and make a purpley ray and some rose, rose to warm up that purpley gray. That's maybe a little bit too pink. I'm gonna add a little bit more raw sienna. Sometimes you have to go back and forth a little bit before you, I said I wasn't gonna mix it all, but I'm probably gonna end up mixing it all in the end just to get the right color. Now, I think that's pretty close to the warm sandy color, but it needs more water added to it. Otherwise, I'm just going to, it's going to look like dirt. I want it to look more like, I'm going to add a little bit more raw sienna. I want it to look more like wet sand. A little bit more raw sienna. There we go. Now, if I put that down on the paper and it's too dark, I'll just have to come in with a wet brush and smooth it out a little bit. And I've got my number six brush and I'm picking up some of that paint, that shadowy color paint and looking at my photo and that shadow, what very often happens on sand is right along the edge of the water, there's a definite shadow where the, the water comes up on the shore or it forms a wet line. I'm just putting that on. I'm taking a wet brush to just dilute it a little bit. This is maybe just a bit too strong. Let's take my wet, wet brush, even thirsty brush. I'm going to add a little bit more, a little bit, tiny bit more rose. Just warm it up a little bit. Just 
and put that shadow in. Now, along with that shadow is also some sort of foamy stuff from the way. So I'm going to do my dry brush trick. I've tapped off my brush on a towel and I'm going to just scrape it across the paper dry so that I get some sort of dry brush happening. And there's a, a definite line between this and the other shadow. I'm going to bring the other shadow in here. It's a very thin shadow here. And kind of a break. And the shadows definitely get warmer as they come towards you. So adding a little bit more rose to that shadow. There's the shadow coming here is much, much pinker. There's an actual divide here. And then the shadow comes up here, kind of gets wider as it comes towards you. Now, this is a small painting, so very difficult to get all that like sea foam in. But when this is dry, I can actually add a little bit of P.H. Martin's white to add a little bit more sea foam to this picture. And right now it looks kind of dark because I've got no darks added to this, this painting. So when you put your first light tones in, they look dark because you've got nothing to compare it to. But we have a lot of darks to put in yet. We have some dark browns on the trunks and dark green on the trees. Um, a little bit of dark along the horizon. So this will come, become lighter and lighter as it dries. And as we add the other darks, you'll, you'll barely notice it. So we've got that in. And one more thing I can do, because I don't want to put wet paint against wet paint at this point, but right here is dry and it doesn't touch any wet paint. So I can put in some of this grassy area, wet in wet, and we can come back and do some detail later. What I would like to do for some of it is I've got some raw sienna here because this is sort of uh, sand with grass growing out of it. So I'm going to put a bit of raw sienna on there. And then I'm going to get some sap green or you can mix a green actually going to mix that sap green with that yellow. A little bit of ultramarine blue just to darken it up slightly. And while I have this um, raw sienna on there, just wet in wet, I'm going to add a little bit of that sap green mix as well. We're going to do more detail on this later, but this is the first layer of just putting in that, that corner there. Again, when you have a corner or an edge, it's good to put some dark in there as a stopper for the eye so your eye doesn't drift out of the picture at that point. Even if it's not in your photograph, it's a good compositional thing to do. Same with this shadow. In the photograph, the shadow does come out about here, about an inch along, but it should never come out right at the corner here, even if it does on the photograph, because again, that takes, your eye comes along here and it goes straight out the corner. Much better to have it sort of coming down to here and gradually kind of curving around towards the viewer, because it also takes the viewer from here into the picture, into where the trees are. So it's, a, it's a, a lot of thought needs to sometimes go into where you put things if you're following a photograph and you don't want to slavishly follow it exactly, but use it to help you paint. Now I'm going to pause the video right now and use my hairdryer because, and you may need to use yours because we can't, we can't do the ocean while these parts are wet. And we can't do the trees while these parts are wet. We, we literally can't do anything else in the painting while these are wet. So I'm going to pause the video. If I can remember how to find the button. Here we go. So we're going to mix the ocean color. I'm going to mix cerulean blue with phthalo green. So I have some cerulean here. I have some cerulean blue from the sky 
already there. So I'm going to add a little bit of phthalo green to it. Not too much because I want it to be still quite blue. And I'm going to add water to that. I don't want it too dark. I can go darker if I need to, but I can't go lighter. I can't get that light back again after, after I painted it. So I often start very, very light and then add more color as I go. I'm going to start, I've got the paint on my number eight brush. So I'm going to start with that. And I'm going to start over here. I'm, not, I'm going to start right at like that tree. I'm not going to paint over the tree because I want it to be a, a much lighter color. And we want to go back and forth horizontally. Now, if you just skip a little part, that gives you a kind of a wave. If you just, as you're coming back and forth, you can just not paint a little bit of it if you're careful. If you're not careful, we'll put in the white later, don't worry. I'm coming back and forth. Remember, this is pretty diluted paint, and that's what gives the sea its sort of glowing look. Right at the edge of the ocean, we want to leave it white for the, the waves. So I'm not going to come, I'm not going to come right up to that dark that I put on there. See, I'm going quite carefully. As long as your paint is wet enough and your brush is big enough, you can work quite carefully at this point. I'm going to get a smaller brush. I want to get my number, what's this, four. Get my number four brush because in between the trees here is kind of fiddly. And there's, um, there's a little rock in between there. I did go with the rock in the photograph because I thought it was kind of a nice detail. And by the way, the photograph I used came from iStock Photos. I bought it because I wanted one with more than one tree. I wanted one with the colors in that I was searching for. And even though I took about 200 pictures in the Caribbean, none of mine, none of mine looked like this. I'm not a professional, I didn't have a particularly great camera, so I'm afraid I didn't get this look to my photos. But I did buy the rights to use this photo from iStock, and that means you're able to download it. Now that's just the beginning of my ocean here. I'm gonna to go to an even smaller brush. I have a number two here, and I'm, I just want to add a little bit more definition in the edge here. Go maybe go along the edge of the the waves. Put a little bit of blue sort of here. I might add a little bit of white later. It just sort of adds to the ocean coming up over the the wet sand here. And now to add a little bit of dark to the horizon line. So I've got that, that color I've already mixed and I'm gonna mix in a little bit of ultramarine blue with that to darken it up. Go to my number four brush again. It's kind of a useful brush for this size of painting. And this is still wet, but it's not really, really wet. So I can pull a little bit of extra paint along the horizon line with that color with a little bit of ultramarine blue added and just darken up the horizon and under these rocks over here. Now, if, if your painting is starting to dry too much and this isn't working for you, stop and do it when the painting's dry, do it in a second layer. Don't wreck your painting by coming in and trying to do it while it's too, while it's too, um, too wet. I've got some yellow going on here, but that's okay. The ocean has yellow in it too. Great, well, green. Just always keep a horizontal look to your, 
your brush strokes. Underneath your wave is going to be a little bit darker. I'm going to put those lines in. And now mine's just reached that point where it's too wet to do any more. What happens is the color soaks in and it doesn't have any definition. So it's time to stop doing the ocean. And I can put in more color later when this is dried. But right now I'm struggling to get that in correctly. So we're going to just, I'm using a very thirsty brush to just gently ease that in. So it's not too, too definite. And I'll come back and do another layer when that's dry. Now, tree trunks. I will put those in next. I need to have the ocean dry before I do that because I don't want my tree trunk color going out into the ocean. And the color, colors we're going to use for that before I, I dry with the hairdryer, colors we're going to use are raw sienna going on first. And then while the raw sienna is wet, we're going to add burnt sienna. And then we're going to mix ultramarine blue and burnt sienna to get these lovely dark browns. And we're going to put those in. And you can do a lot of that wet in wet. Um, at the top of the tree, there's, I think, in these trees, coconut palms. And there's these very dark parts that come out of the center um, and sort of stick out. So we can put those in as well. It's, it's lovely to have our darks in. But we have to have the ocean dry before we do any of that. So I'm going to just pause and use the hairdryer. So I have dried the ocean. You can see it's pulled away from my tape a little bit on this side. I've dried it a bit too quickly. If you use your hairdryer too, too hot, it will shrink your paper very fast and pull it away from your tape. Right, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna to have to work fairly fast with the wet and wet because it's a pretty small area to work on. So I wanna get my colors ready before I start doing that. And let's look over here. Let's get some raw sienna. A lot of people use um, yellow ochre, which is very similar to raw sienna, except raw sienna is much more transparent. And I prefer raw sienna. This is my, this cakey stuff is my yellow ochre. And it, it's got white mixed with it to make it more opaque. And for that reason, although it's a very similar color, I don't like it as much because it's more opaque. So I don't. Don't use that one. We also need some burnt sienna. I need my other tray. So we need some burnt sienna as well, ready to mix wet in wet with the raw sienna. Now it doesn't need to be too wet because when you mix wet in wet, you can't have your paints too wet or they, they all kind of go to a one color. They flow into each other too much. And the other thing we want to make right here, because I've got some, I have some ultramarine blue here. So if I've got some paint on my palette, use it. And I'm going to wet that ultramarine up and I'm going to add some burnt sienna to it. And look, I've mixed a gorgeous, gorgeous dark brown color, which we're going to use for the darks on the tree. If it's not dark enough, Add a bit more, add a bit more ultramarine. Look at that gorgeous color. It's almost like chocolate, but darker, dark chocolate. That's, um, and not much paint, not much water, sorry. Plenty of paint, but not much water. And that will give you a nice strong dark. So I mix those with my number eight brush, which I'm not going to use because I'm doing little tiny. They're actually palms are not trees. I read that they're a grass, they're a type of grass because they, they don't have a bark. They don't have branches. They just grow straight up and um, of course have the, the leaves and the fruit at the top. There's only a couple of species that have um, one branch, I think at the top, but most, most of them just grow like, like a piece of grass or bamboo, and it's one, one piece, no bark, no xylem and everything in the center. They're very, very different to a tree, although we call them trees. But that's why they grow so thin, because they don't grow outwards 
with bark like a regular tree does. They just grow upwards. Right, smaller brush. Um, let's see what size I would like to use. I think I'll start with a, not too many brushes, four, and then use my two to add some of the details. I'm going to get my raw sienna. And I'll do one tree at a time. I'm going to do this one because this one is in the light quite a bit. And that's something you want to aim for in your in your painting is to have some light and dark values. So you have a lot of interest in your painting. The light and the dark will give it, give it a really good, interesting look. See, if I just put raw sienna on, it's kind of flat, not anything very interesting to that tree trunk at all. But now I'm going to go into my burnt sienna with my number two brush, my smaller brush, and start adding a bit of shadow at the top here. And I'm going to keep my shadow on the um, left hand side because the shadow coming off the trees on the right. And down here, uh, the tree is quite a bit in shade. So I'm going to put a lot more shadow down here. And again, I have to really kind of wait for that raw sienna to soak in so that the burnt sienna doesn't just flood into it and make one single color. And I've got to take, sometimes if it's very small, you just want to wait for it to be dry and take a little bit down there, a little bit come down here. And I'm going to pull it around. The tree has this, which I'm pretty sure is coconut, has the kind of lines going around the tree like that. I'm going to take the dark brown. Actually, I'm not. I'm not going to take the dark brown. I'm going to take the raw sienna first because some of these coconuts are in the sunlight. I'm going to put the raw sienna on first, come back and put the dark brown on in a moment. I'm not going to put the dark brown on right now because it will flood into all the other browns and they'll just all become one brown. I'm going to put it on when these are dry. There's a, a slender tree behind here. And again, where they cross over, everything will blend together if you're not careful. So you can do more detail when these are dry. Remember, your raw sienna is just your base color. It's not, it's not your main tree trunk. Same with this grass down here. This is your base color. I can even add. Now this is um, dry. I can add a bit more here, the, the sand underneath the, underneath the grass. I can pop that in with that raw sienna when I've got it and the green is dry. Make sure I take this right down to the, the grass. I'm not going to put the dark on for a minute. I'm just going to leave that one for a moment, put the dark on. Afterwards, it's so tiny. I am going to, there's some coconuts up here under this. You can barely see this tree coming in here in the photograph. It's kind of hidden. And then the foreground one, same thing. I'm going to put, I'm going to put the lighter brown up there and I'll darken that when it's dry. I'll come down this tree. A bit more water on my brush to make my paint flow. And because this tree is the closest one to you, you can do more detail on this one. A little bit more raw sienna. There's going to be some quite dark ducks on there. Right, that's just my raw sienna layer. Now let's go into the burnt sienna. Let's start at the top here. And put a bit of uh, burnt sienna up there. And definitely some shadow here. Remember, I just want the shadow 
as I come out to the sunlight just on the one side, I might wait till it's dry to put more shadow on. You don't have to do even painting. I'm leaving some of the paint showing through here because at the, that part of the tree or the palm, I should say, it, it has a lot of wear and tear. There's cracks and uh, markings on the, on the palm. So doing a few of those little lines going around it, a few of them up here. Now, again, that is just the beginning. We can come in and do more detail on these, but you can't do it all at once, not with something this small. Put a little bit more in here because this has dried a little bit. And a little bit more on these. What I can put on, that I want at the moment, I'll put them on after the green. I could put the... You can put them on at any time, but I think after the green, these bits up here that stick out at the top, but I'll put them on after I put the green on. A few little things you can do because your ocean is dry. You can put on this little piece of land over here. I have raw sienna on my palette, so I'm going to put raw sienna at the bottom of this little land form here, just a tiny, tiny bit. I'm going to take some of that green that I made for the grass, which was the sap green and the cadmium, and azo yellow, rather. Now, you can use anything of your greens. If you've got hooker's green, you can mix it with azo yellow. If you don't have a green, you can mix uh, ultramarine blue with azo yellow. You can mix thalo blue with azo yellow. It'll give you quite a sharp green, but you can bring that down a bit by adding a little bit of red or a little bit of rose, it'll bring the green down to a forest green. You can mix green so many ways. I love the Daniel Smith sap green. It is a beautiful green and it just makes life quick. If you've got a, a good sort of forest green, leaf green in your palette. I didn't used to ever have a green in my palette. I used to just mix them all the time. But I've I've added a few more colors over the years. I'm just going to add green to that uh, piece of land in the background. I'm going to darken it later, but you can't darken it all at once. It, it blends too much, a little thing like that. I will, I'm um, going to add a little bit of, let's see, I've got this, I've got the sap green and yellow. And if I add a bit of ultramarine blue to it, which that was a little bit too much, I'm a bit wild with that. I can darken up that green, a little bit more sap green. So I can give a little bit more shadow here under the trees. I can have a slightly darker green under here. I need a bit more, a little bit more water in my brush to blend this in. I'm gonna pull with my small brush, I'm gonna pull up, pull up over the tree here, a few sort of like you see the grassy strokes. Again, remember that, that corner thing? I'm going to have some shadows on this corner here uh, at the base of this tree. I want the tree to sit right down in the grass. I'm going to pull the tree back into the, the grass in a moment with the dark brown too. So that first layer of green and raw sienna, that was just to, that was just just to get something in there. Now we're actually building on that with some dark green. And now behind behind these trees, I think they should because they were on dry paper, they should be dry enough to put this background green in. I'm gonna do go do some wet and wet with that. What you want is that that darker green that I just mixed, which was my sap green. Azo yellow and ultramarine blue. You can mix it with phthalo blue, ultramarine blue, and azo yellow, uh, one of your other blues in yellow. 
hookers green, whatever you got. I, I advise against thalo green because thalo green is too bit too bright. And for your lighter green, again, you want to go into your sap green and azo yellow, but but lighter than that than this green. And a little brush, I've got my number two brush. We're going in a small part of the landscape. So I'm going in with the, the light green now. I'm putting the light green back here. There's going to be some rocks there that are going to go in as well. Got to leave a bit of white for those rocks. I'm putting in the light green first. Don't go over your tree trunks. That's why I'm using a small brush so I can actually go around those tree trunks without too much trouble. And also there's some rocks I have to not paint here. This is all in the background, in the distance. So you don't have to be too fussy or too careful. I mean, you can't be slapdash, but you don't, you don't have to fuss if, it, if it's not exactly how you imagine it. And I'm washing my brush and drying it. I want it fairly dry. I'm going into that dark green that I just mixed. And I'm going to put, I'm going to let that mix wet in wet with that light green to get that kind of uh, trees in shade and sunlight look. Again, if, you're, if your light green's too wet, it's all going to just become one, one shade of green. So you need to have your dark green a little less wet and your light green. It's definitely going to be darker down next to your rocks. And I'm going to put a little bit more dark green on this side in places. You don't want this too detailed. It's a long way away. Wash my brush again. And behind these trees is a little rock. So I'm going to use my raw sienna for a base color on that rock. Too dark. A little bit more water with it. I could, I could have actually done it at the same time as the tree trunk and then come and done the tree trunk shadows another when it was dry, but very similar color. And we have some rocks coming out away from these trees. I don't want to put these rocks in right now because it'll flow up into the green. I can put these ones on a little bit of that dark brown. These rocks over here. I'm going between the raw sienna and the dark brown to get a combination of light and dark for these rocks. Now, okay, I've reached a point now where most of this part is quite wet, but I can definitely work on the tree fronds because they are dry. Everything up here is dry. So we can start working on them. And um, you want a really small brush for this, either a liner brush, a rigger brush, or a number one or a number two brush, because you're going to make all those lines on the fronds with your small brush. I'm going to get my rigger brush out. I'm going to go between my rigger brush and my number two brush for those. Right, we have a nice, have a nice green mixed up here. That's a sort of a mid green. We're going to come in after we've done this green with a much darker green to to make the even darker fronds. But this mid green's good. So you want sort of azo yellow with some sap green and maybe a little bit of ultramarine blue. And if you if you want a few dilutions of green, you can you can have the azo yellow here to make some of the lighter ones over here where this raw sienna was. I'm going to put ultramarine blue azo yellow. I'm not going to have any sap green in this one. I'm going to go more. And then to that, I'm going to add some burnt sienna just to darken it up a little bit, a bit more ultramarine blue. Looks pretty dark in my palette, but you'd be amazed how much lighter it will look once we get it on the paper. So 
Oh. Now, I don't know where you want to start with your fronds. Um, maybe, maybe up here so you're not putting your hand in wet paint and so you can have a little bit of a practice with them where they're not so defined. Now, first of all, I want to get some of that very yellowy green. And I'm going to pull down with my tip of my number two brush, working with the tip of the brush. I'm going to pull down some of those fronds like this. And I'm going to push some up in the sky too. Now, sometimes these fronds get all broken. You don't see the whole frond. And that's okay if you don't have some bits showing. Another lovely color for doing the ribs sort of things on them is the, you can either use raw sienna or gamboge. I don't know if you have gamboge. It's rather beautiful orangey yellow. And sometimes where parts of the tree hit the sunlight, you can really see this orangey yellow. So I'm going to put a few, I'm going to put a few sort of gamboge bits in here and there for those parts, those parts that are really hitting the sunlight. If you find you've put too many, you put too many in, it doesn't matter. You can come back over them with some, with some green later. I'll put one here. I should be looking at my reference photo and not my painting. I have my reference photo in front of me here. Uh -huh. Not very helpful. I'll just look at my painting. That's okay. Right. Okay, I'm going back to the very, very light green now. And I'm going to put in some of these, these fronds. And you're going to have to work in layers with these. This is your very light layer. I'll put some here. Now, I've got my very light layer in. I'm going into that mid green, that the green that we've used for a lot of things. And I'm going to start putting in some darker, darker fronds. Remember the, the branches twist and you don't always see the whole branch. I'm putting in those. There'll be some that you see from the, the branch behind, the branch underneath. The center of the front is quite light. Work slowly. You don't have to rush with these. If you have the photo in front of you, look at it to see how, how they're formed. And obviously, once you get to the center of the tree, everything gets much darker at the center of the tree. So you can go, I'm going to go into my darker green paint and put some of those shadow. That is a bit dark. Add a little bit of yellow to that. And it's a bit too dark. Got a bit carried away with making dark paint. There we go. So right near the center of the tree, where there's not much sunlight getting in, it's going to get, get darker. And you, you don't have to put those darks in straight away. You can just wait. I put them in a little bit so you can sort of just find my way to start with. And then when I start to find my way, I kind of get to know where I'm going. The other thing at the center there is you can darken up the coconuts. And the, and the bits that stick out, get those sort of in. Start darken these up. Again, it just helps you find your way a little bit. If you know where the center is and what is happening there. There's a bit of shadow on the tree. Again, a bit of shadow here. Really helps. Right, let's go back over here. I'm going back into the medium green. This is the more time consuming part, the putting in the, the tree fronds. And you don't have to be um, really exact with all of them. See that one I just put in really quickly because it's right near the edge of the paper and I don't need to see everything of that frond. 
Some of them you can connect them. Remember, watercolors for the most part is is a little bit abstract. It's not it's not hyper realistic usually. I mean, it can be. There's no reason it it can't be hyper realistic. But most of the time, it's a bit more loose, wet and wet, a bit more abstract. We have another branch coming down here. Again, when I got a branch coming down, I'm do this one with raw sienna. A branch coming down. I want to have the center part of the frond a bit lighter, either the gamboge or the raw sienna. Those ones with raw sienna. And my medium green paint. And this one's kind of curling down here. Don't always have to be super, super accurate. This one's sort of coming out. It doesn't have all of its, some of its fronds are missing. Now we don't have to put them all in. This one too. If you put if you put enough of them in good detail, the viewer's eye will fill in the other parts that you just kind of smush in with a bit of paint. Our brains are very good at doing that, filling in what we don't actually see, especially when you get it all together, finished. Uh, anybody looking at it, their brain can't take in all the detail at once, so they fill in all the areas and make a picture of it based on what they know it to be. So you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to worry too much about all of the all of the fronds being equal or individual. And the nice thing is because we put that yellow on first, we we have some, we have like nice bright yellow showing. And I really like like the gamboge showing in some bits. I'm going to do some of these with the gamboge before I put the other color on. Another thing that's happening in the photograph is there are um, tree fronds up here from the tree that we don't even see in the picture. It's one that's over here. So they're coming down as well which adds a little bit to the confusion for the eye, which is not a bad thing. As long as you don't sort of get lost and, and uh, can't remember why, where you're supposed to be painting something or what you're painting, try and, try and keep track a little bit. Going over, just going over these with some gamboge. Putting a few in. And again, this is a pretty slow process. I might, um, when I when I share the you um, not the YouTube the Zoom video, I'll of course share it in its entirety. But I think when I do the YouTube video, I'm going to edit a little bit out because it gets way too long. People get bored. But I can pretty much say, I like, just keep doing this. Keep making your palm fronds, keep adding your fronds. I'm going to add a little bit of phthalo green to one of my greens. Not too much because it's very strong green. And some yellow. But I do I do want to have I do want to have some different greens. So these dark greens. I add a little bit of phthalo green and azo yellow to that dark green just to to have some slightly different greens and some darker. Oh, 
I had too, too much paint on my brush then. Uh, on my original, there's quite a bit of like blurry stuff happening too. You don't always see both sides. Sometimes it's folded over and you only see part of the front. Get some yellow. I'm sure you're all very quietly working away on your on your tree fronds. I'm a bit worried about just boring you to death here. But if you're working, I'm sure you're happy. Remember, they get, they get smaller as they come towards the tip. Some of them go in other directions. They don't always, um, they're not always even, is what I'm trying to say. And I'm sort of putting the, the fronds on, and then I got to connect the, the center a little bit so it's not too disconnected. Going to the really yellowy green. This one's sort of um, going on with the very yellowy green first, and then I'm going to put the other green wet and wet over the top. This one's kind of um, twisted. You can't see all of it. The yellowy green on this one. And I'm going to go in with my, my darker a bit of my mid green and my darker green. Put that on wet and wet with that yellowy green. Uh, this one's a probably, it's got a few broken palm leaves on it and some coming down above from above here now i've got to get some dark some dark centers in the trees I'm going to my number two brush and that dark brown we mixed up. We used ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, and that little bit of, I think I used a little bit of sepia, but mostly ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. And I want to take that in and make these centers of the trees, palms rather, a lot darker, add some shadows in there. Some of those parts that stick out shadows shadow on the on this part and this is all the tree trunk is, is all dry now so i can add some more detail here like i said we're going to bring this tree down way more into the grassy area and use my dry brush and then scrape it up up the tree to give it a bit of texture Maybe come across a little bit to give it some lines. Definitely going to go up one edge to darken one edge there. And it has a bit of a split here. So I'm going to get the dark and put that split in the trunk there. And a few more lodges and spots. Now giving that detail to the closest one to you pulls it forward and gives you a foreground in your painting, which is really important. You don't have to do that much detail in the other ones. I'm still going to, I'm still going to put 
the dark at the bottom and the top and maybe the edge and definitely definitely the dark in the tree and this one too but you don't need as much don't need as much detail in that one that's far away but you definitely need definitely need the darks i think one thing that a lot of people don't complete is the darks in their paintings they're a little afraid of the the darks and they stop just before they get to that stage and it's the it's putting in a lot of those little little dark details that really really finish off a painting and give your eye interesting things to look at. <clears throat> the other thing that needs some dark is the rock over here. I'm going to take that that brown that I was just I mixed with the blue and the burnt sienna. I'm going to water it down a little bit. I don't want it that strong. Just to put some shading on this rock behind this tree. And I have to be careful not to touch the tree trunk. I'm being a bit bold doing it at the same time. I've got that color on my brush put that on I want a little bit of raw sienna a bit of raw sienna on my brush and there are a few few rocks over here I'm going to put some raw sienna on get some of that brown and also put some brown on those rocks over there wet and wet and maybe here too The other thing I can do is take some of that darker green, one that's got some blue in it, and I can put a little bit more definition over here in the background trees. That's too strong at the moment, but I'm going to get a wet brush, wash it out, take a little bit of the moisture off, and I'm going to agitate that green in just with a wet brush just to give some shading and definition to these trees over here i don't want to do it wet on wet because it will just in that small space it will dissolve into the rest of it i'm just going to put that on dry on drip and work it in with a wet brush now we don't have too much else to do to the painting definitely when these tree fronds are dry i want to come in with some darker green and put I'll put um, like shadows in here. Just put some shadow in and then add a few fronds because it's a little bit too, too light at the center of the palm here. But what I would prefer to do is do this when it's nice and dry. Because working on paper that's just slightly damp is it's very difficult and you don't get a good definition to anything. I'm going to wait for that to be nice and dry to do that. Put a bit of extra green in there. One thing I do want to do, remember the ocean, I wanted it a little bit darker at the horizon. And this is a good time to do that because the ocean is very dry. And I'm going to, I've got my, what number is this? Number eight brush. I'm going to wet the ocean up a little bit just so I can get the horizon on a little bit easier. Go into my smaller number four brush and get that ultramarine blue and sea color and add a bit more definition to the horizon. It will just, it'll flood into that water that I just put on there and stop it from getting too, too strong. I don't want to put water over here. I've got a you know, small brush. Got too much going on here with trees and rocks and stuff. And I can put some shadow around the rock. The other thing I can do with a dry brush, if I leave some of the ocean dry, is I can put a few wavy lines in the dry, dry ocean here just to give a few waves. I definitely don't want. Do not want to go over all of that lovely, lovely light 
light green color that makes the ocean kind of glow. Another thing that makes it glow a little bit is if you mix that mix of, um, let's bring my palette over here. I did a mix at the beginning of azo yellow and phthalo green to make a very yellowy green. I want it too, I want it too anything, not too green, not too yellow, not too dark. But if I take just a little bit of that on my brush, I can put a bit of that glow in the ocean just here where it comes up to the sand and the sun is really shining through it. I have so little on my brush and you don't want, you definitely don't want like stripes of this. But just that little bit of greeny yellow glow as it comes up to the edge of the sand is lovely. What you always want is that kind of transparency of water so that you can see your white paper glowing through. And if you remember here, this time I just left white paper for the sand because so often the, the sand is very white in the Caribbean. It's, it's um, not yellow. Or well, one thing we have to do um, is put the shadows on. Also, I have, on this one, I have a lot more shadow in this wet area of sand and you can build that up and I have the big tree shadow. So first of all, I have that, that shadow mix here, that like gray purple mix and add a little bit of cobalt to it, a little bit more cobalt to it, just a tiny bit and water, of course. And on my dry paper, I'm going to add a little bit more shadow here. That's a little bit too dark take that down as I've got a wet brush to just pull that back a bit as soon as you put color on if it's too dark just get a wet brush and just like pull it back a little bit before it dries and soaks in and I'm going to put a bit of shadow close to the see I'm wiggling back and forth with my brush little number two brush just to put a bit of shadow close to the wave area and we can also come back with some Dr. P.H. Martin's white to darken that up a bit. Nothing says sunlight like shadow. Shadows scream sunlight. All right now, scary, scary, scary part. You might want to practice this in your book before you do it. And that's the, the big tree shadow. I like ultramarine blue, just ultramarine blue for shadows. It's uh, a lovely color so I'm just going to get a clean area to my palette get some of that yellow off and put some water on there get a touch of ultramarine blue add a little bit of water and then test it out grab, grab one of my many tree pictures and, and test it out I need to add a little bit more, a bit more water. I'm going to add just a touch, just a touch of rose, just to make it slightly, just slightly more warm, more violet. Just it's very slight. Do test it out before you use it. Now I'm going to show you how watered down I've done this. I've added a little bit of rose, not much. I'm not making purple or anything. And I've watered it down because I just want a shadow color. I don't want a really deep blue color. So I think that's good enough. Um, we don't want a brush that's too small, but not too big either, because we need a little bit of control. So I'm going with my number six, getting my shadow color. And I want to have a really good look at my reference photo because I only get one chance with this. I only get one chance to get it right. We have to reflect the fronds of the tree. I'm going with the biggest ones first. The biggest ones are here. And again, it doesn't have to be 100% accurate. Nobody's going to go examine and see if you've got it 100% accurate, but it's got to be close. 
doing that one first. There's a couple coming out here, right here. And that's curving right back to the tree. There's one there. And here. Now I'm going to get my small number two brush, some of that blue. And you can actually see, don't put the frond shapes in first, put your big shapes in first for your shadow. And then you can get your little brush. I'm just pulling out a little bit of that shadow color. Just to make a little bit of shape. I got some over the tree. What I'm doing is I'm just pulling it back and then wiping it off. There's also some shadow coming from this tree, just here. We can put some from that tree just because we can if we want to. Some in the corner. And then up the tree. I've got my ultramarine blue wash now. A little bit on this rock. A little bit on this shore. Connecting all of these areas with some shadow color. A little bit in the waves. Really, really delicate. Really going delicate here. And maybe, maybe a little bit more along the horizon now that that's dried a bit. Getting a little bit fussy. It's got to stop being so fussy with it. Yeah. Now, when you first put paint on, it will look too dark. It will look too wet and it will look too scary. And your first instinct will be to take it off or dab it off, leave it alone. It soaks in, it dries lighter. It's going to be absolutely fine when it's dry. You don't, ha you don't have to do that. And I'm going to, um, I'm nearly done. What I will do when it's dry is I will put some more darks on the fronds close to the center of the tree, maybe a few more dark fronds coming here and there. And I will put maybe a little bit of pH white onto the waves right here, just so it's got a little bit more foam. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to pause, I'm going to mute, and I'm going to get this nice and dry with the hairdryer, just so I can demonstrate putting in the white waves. The last thing I want to do is put in some a little bit of white to get some of that white back. I keep I keep my pH Martin's white in a little dish. I'm gonna put a little bit more in there. I don't know how clean my dish is actually. Add a little bit of my, my water's very clean because I don't want my white to get dirty. I'm gonna get a little bit on my, a little bit on my brush and I'm just putting it in my little dish here so I can adjust the consistency. Of course, you can always re-wet it. It's a water-based paint that will re-wet. Don't listen to any of the purists that say, oh, you just have to leave the whites of your paper. And I don't even like masking fluid. They, they don't give lovely, delicate little whites. Oil painters use white all the time. Nobody ever fusses with them. So do acrylic painters. I don't know why anybody fusses with watercolor painters who want to use a little bit of white. Right, so I've got my little tiny brush, zero, zero, zero. And of course you don't mix with these tiny brushes or you're gonna destroy them. I'm gonna get a little bit of that white that I just mixed up and load my little brush, keeping the point nice and pointed. And I'm just gonna add a little bit more foam to these waves, just by going sort of like dot -a -dee dot -a -dee dot and, and making it a little bit more jagged. And the other place I want a little bit more foam uh, that's a bit more um, frilly, fluffy, what's the word? Foamy, <laughs> it's foamy, it's a bit more foamy. I want to make it a little bit more foamy here in the, in the waves coming up against the shore. So I'm sort of just 
So wiggling my brush and putting some foam in that wet sand. A few little waves here, uh, some coming up against the rocks maybe. It's one of those sort of final little touches that it just helps pick the painting up a little bit and give it the look of waves coming up against the wet sand. Quite often where the waves hit the rocks, there's a little bit of uh, sea foam too. No, don't overdo it. Don't like get masses and masses of it in there. It's going to be overkill. But you can definitely put, I'm going to have a look at my photograph. There's not very much in here. This, this sort of gap between the wet places is quite white, shiny, reflective because it's wet. You always make it a bit more reflective if you've lost that with your shadow colors. A bit more coming along here. It's just giving it a little, little bit, bit more detail, a little pick me up there. And if there, there were a few, there were a few fronds that were very, very light. You could always put. If you want a few fronds that are very, very light, you could always put those in with a little bit of white too. You know, some of them reflect the sunlight so brightly and the Caribbean sun is so bright that they might glow, glow white and you can pop those in. And of course, the other thing that you will need to do is add a bit of dark green to, um, to some of these. You still need to work on getting some darker green in there and some coming in coming in over the top of these ones from a tree that's outside our, our vision here, which actually I sort of haven't really put going properly off the paper. I need to get that and get a few more darks in here, more darks in here, just to give the tree some density at the center. But you, it's a small painting. You don't need to overdo any of those things and a few bits of wispy grass. But, but you should be you should be good. If you've got that much done in a small painting, it should be pretty good. I'm going to take the, the tape off. Tomorrow I'll be doing this one again in the live class. At least I get practice the day before. Well, there's that one. There's the one I did. Let's zoom out a little bit. There's the one I did um, a few weeks ago to get ready for class. I've got loads and loads and loads of trees that I did while I was practicing, practicing my colors. And that's why you shouldn't be too hard on yourself if it doesn't go right the first time, because it seldom goes right the first time for me. I have to... I have to have quite a few tries at it before I figure it out and get the right color. I think this was probably the closest I got to the ocean color. And sometimes I try and emulate what's in the photograph, but it just doesn't work in watercolor. I can't get that, that intensity of color. So anyway, I hope yours turned out really well. That was a, a fun couple of hours and uh, I can't even remember what we're doing next week. Let me have a look and see. I remember now we're doing something called the Devil's Marbles in Australia, in the outback of southern Australia. There's some amazing rocks called the Devil's Marbles and can use some gorgeous reds and oranges and bright colours. I'm really into bright colours this time and, and making things look a bit more bright and sunny. So I'm when I finish the recording and I stop it, I'll chat to you and uh, see how you did. And uh, that was fun.